this week's lab, we are going to look at reactions and the factors that affect them. We're going to look at uh, basically how things like temperature and concentration and the presence of a catalyst uh, can affect the rate of a reaction, can speed it up accordingly. Uh, and we're going to look at reversible reactions, uh, where the forward and reverse reactions occur at the same time. And we're going to see uh, you know, how this equilibrium that gets established can be shifted using Le Chatelier's principle. So we'll look at various factors that affect uh, the position of this equilibrium. So over here I've got two test tubes, each with 10 milliliters of 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid. Uh, we're going to look at the effect of temperature on the rate of reaction. So we're going to uh, add some uh, sodium bicarbonate or baking soda to the samples of hydrochloric acid and see how quickly the uh, carbon dioxide bubbles clear away. Now, uh, you know, we're going to, we're obviously, we have a hot test tube and a cold test tube, so we're going to see the effect that uh, temperature has on each of these solutions. All right, so if we look at our thermometer here, we can see that we are at a temperature it might be a little hard to see here with this, uh, this webcam, but I would say we're about 52 degrees Celsius, probably climbing a little bit by the time we, we get this uh, thermometer taken out, uh, or this test tube taken out. But we'll let this uh, ice bath here also cool down. We can see what temperature that's going to be at. All right, now it seems to be cooling down to about... Might be a little hard to see there, but it's right now it's about six degrees Celsius. Okay, so let's uh, go ahead and put those in a test tube holder. Okay, so I have my two test tubes here. The one on the left is the hot one that's about um, you know about 53 degrees Celsius, and the one on the right is the one that dropped down to about six degrees in the uh, in the ice bath. So let's go ahead and add a spatula tip full to each of them Very quickly. You should be able to see a clear difference uh, in their levels of reactivity. So you can see uh, if you're having trouble seeing them. The, uh, the one on the right is still going. It still has, you can see the cloudiness from uh, the unreacted uh, sodium bicarbonate and the bubbles that are still evolving from it. Whereas the one on the left is our hot water one. You can see that it's, uh, it's definitely cleared up a lot faster there. Okay, so if you're having trouble seeing that, uh, let's uh, hold that against the, the dark background of the... Um, uh, of our bench top here, and hopefully that'll be a little bit easier to see. Okay, so you can see our test tube on the right still has bubbles evolving, okay, whereas our test tube on the left, which was in the hot water bath, cleared up much, much quicker. All right, here we have three test tubes of uh, hydrochloric acid, each with 10 milliliters, but the difference between them is the concentration of the hydrochloric acid. In our test tube on the left here, we have one molar hydrochloric acid. Okay, that means that for every liter of the solution, there's one mole of HCl dissolved in there. Uh, in our second, uh, in our second uh, test tube, we have two molar HCl, so double that concentration. And in our third test tube, we have three molar HCl, triple that concentration of our first one. Okay, so to each of these, I'm going to add some uh, magnesium ribbon. I'm going to add a piece of magnesium ribbon, and I'm going to have a stopwatch uh, running. So please make a note of the time at which each test tube clears. Okay, so once all of our magnesium has dissolved, uh, you know, you can make a note of that time. Alrighty, let's start with our one molar hydrochloric acid. I'm going to take a piece of magnesium ribbon and add it into our test tube and start our stopwatch. And go. Okay, you can see the uh, hydrogen gas that's uh, bubbling from there, you know, that's uh, being produced as the magnesium displaces the hydrogen in our hydrochloric acid. 
So keep an eye on that and again make a note of the time at which uh, all of the magnesium has disappeared and you have, uh, you know, basically all of your magnesium has been converted into magnesium chloride and your hydrogen and your hydrochloric acid has been converted to hydrogen gas. So it's still bubbling, so make a note that, uh, you know, basically you're waiting for it to stop bubbling completely. Okay, looks like that's just about done there. All right, next up we have our two molar hydrochloric acid. So same thing, we'll go ahead and drop our magnesium in. We've got our magnesium ready here and we'll start our stopwatch as soon as we do that. And go. Yeah, notice that the, the bubbling seems to be a little bit more vigorous here, right? So uh, please note that rate and time are not the same thing. Um, you know, when when the speed or rate of your reaction increases, the time it takes to finish should decrease. So be very wary of how you phrase your answer. So you can see already that uh, you, know, you might want to rewind this and see at what point uh, the magnesium disappeared, but you can see it's already all gone. Um, so uh, be wary of how you phrase your answer, whether you're talking about the speed or rate of the reaction versus the time it takes for the uh, magnesium to disappear. All right, and here's our third and final test tube of uh, three molar hydrochloric acid. We're going to add our magnesium to that and get ready to start our stopwatch. And go. You know, this is the most vigorous yet. So, again, uh, the speed at which uh, the reaction uh, occurs, the, the vigor or uh, those bubbles appear, so that effervescence is, you know, not the same thing as the time it takes for it to disappear, which hopefully you should be, you know, made a note of there. Okay, and that's it for that one. In this part of the lab, we are going to take different catalysts, or, or things that could be catalysts at least, and uh, add them to the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. Now, if you recall from an earlier lab, uh, hydrogen peroxide decomposes into water and oxygen gas, but this reaction is very, very slow. Now, we sped up the reaction last time using some potassium iodide, um, and so in this lab, we're going to try a few other things to try and speed up this really slow reaction. So up here, you can see I've got five test tubes. Uh, I've already added two milliliters of hydrogen peroxide to each of them. Okay, so if you want to have a little bit close-up look over there, there's our five test tubes, and it's kind of hard to see any bubbles forming. All right, uh, I'll see if I can get you a closer look later on once we get these reactions started. The various uh, catalysts or potential catalysts we're going to use today include uh, manganese 4 oxide, commonly known as manganese dioxide. We have mossy zinc, uh, which is basically just uh, you know little chunks or granules of zinc. 
Uh, over here we have the world's cutest potato. Uh, potatoes are very versatile. They have, uh, you know, well, you can boil them, mash them, stick them in a stew. Uh, but they also contain catalase. Now, catalase is a protein uh, that functions as an enzyme. Now, uh, if you've taken a biology course before, you've probably learned about enzymes and learned that they are uh, basically protein catalysts, right? They can uh, catalyze reactions, speed them up, or carry out certain reactions. Uh, and uh, so catalase is one of these. So we're going to see the effect of catalase on hydrogen peroxide to see whether it happens to catalyze that particular reaction or not. Um, over here, of course, we have some boiled potatoes. Now, why are we using boiled potatoes as opposed to a regular potato? Um, well, boiling actually denatures catalysts. Uh, it uh, denatures proteins in general. It causes the shape of the protein to change. Uh, and therefore, it doesn't uh, have the same physical properties, and in some cases, chemical properties. Uh, so we're going to see whether the denaturing of the, uh, the catalase protein in your potatoes stops it functioning as an enzyme, stops it functioning as a catalyst. Okay, so uh, something to keep in mind when you see the results of this lab, okay, or this part of the lab. All right, I've gone ahead and added a dark background here to our five test tubes, uh, each with two milliliters of hydrogen peroxide. Um, so hopefully I'll make things a little bit easier to see. Uh, and as I mentioned, I might uh, take a close up uh, with my cell phone to give you some you know, different footage here uh, if, if it's a little bit hard to observe what's going on. Now over here in our first test tube, uh, we're gonna use this as our reference or standard. Uh, so. I'm basically not going to add anything to this. Uh, this has two milliliters of hydrogen peroxide, and you can kind of see uh, what the effect is when we don't, uh, you know, when we, um, well, when the reaction happens uncatalyzed. Uh, if you recall uh, from that, uh, from the lab we did earlier on types of reactions, uh, this is a very slow reaction. So even though technically this is decomposing, uh, this is happening so slowly that you probably won't observe any bubbles of, of oxygen forming. It's, it's almost impossible to notice. Here's a close-up of our reference test tube, or standard, uh, just so you can see, um, you know, the, uh, well, lack of evidence of de decomposition here, just showing how slow this uncatalyzed reaction is. You can't really see any bubbles right now. So, uh, again, this is a good comparison uh, for whether or not, uh, you know, we have a catalyzed reaction. You'll see that when we do have a catalyzed reaction, there'll be a pretty stark difference in the number of bubbles and the speed at which they appear. Okay. So to the second test tube over here, we're going to add a little bit of our manganese uh, four oxide. Okay. So let's go ahead and add a tiny spatula tip full of that, and we'll get to see, observe some of that reaction. Here's a replay of that uh, addition of manganese 4 oxide, just a little bit closer up. Uh, so you can see uh, uh, definitely uh, <laughs> there's a significant difference here from uh, our standard, our reference test tube. Um, okay, so all those bubbles you're seeing are actually bubbles of oxygen gas being produced by the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. Okay, so, so notice the, the vigorous bubbling that we observe here uh, compared to our reference test tube. All right, to this third test tube, we're going to add our mossy zinc. Uh, so again, just uh, you know, take a little bit, a little piece of this zinc. Probably take this little chunk here. I don't know if you guys can see that very well, but there's a little chunk of that zinc. We're going to add that to test tube number three. And there we go. Here is a potato. I'm going to uh, cut out a chunk of this potato and uh, add it to test tube number four. So I'll just use a spatula here that should probably be sufficient uh, to get the job done. So if you want to see that there, just uh, take out a little chunk of that. There we go. So we'll go ahead and add that to test tube number four.
Yeah, there we go. You should be able to see the uh, bubbles coming off of our chunk of potato. Okay, so hopefully from this angle, you should be able to see a stream of bubbles coming off of our potato. Okay, so please make a note of that. Uh, you know, feel free to make a note of the, the rate at which they're coming off if you want to compare them. I believe uh, one of the questions in the section of the lab asks you to compare, uh, to decide which is the best catalyst we have. So, so determining how quickly the bubbles are coming off of uh, our, our potato might be uh, you know, something to, to keep in mind when you're comparing the different, uh, uh, the effectiveness of the different catalysts. All right, so here we've got our uh, can of potatoes. Uh, so again, these have been pre-boiled before they were canned. Uh, so you can see we've got our slices of potato here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and cut out a chunk of uh, one of these with a spatula and add it to test tube number five. And we'll go ahead and observe, uh, well, what there is to observe. I'm very careful here to use a fresh spatula. I uh, don't want to use a uh, the same one I used for the potato uh, in case uh, any of the fresh enzymes on our fresh potato uh, get in here onto our uh, boiled potato. So here's just the boiled potato added to our hydrogen peroxide there. Okay. And I'll get a close-up of that uh, for you guys to observe. All right, uh, so you can you probably notice some things floating around in there. Those are just flakes of boiled potato. Uh, you can tell they're not oxygen because oxygen gas would have would start those bubbles of oxygen gas would be rising uh, to the surface of our hydrogen peroxide uh, solution. You can see that that's not the case. All right, so I think there's a few bubbles at the top there that are staying stationary. Uh, those are probably just uh, air that got trapped. Uh, when the uh, potato chunk was dropped in. I'm gonna shake this up to, to kind of get rid of those bubbles, hopefully. Just disrupt those. Oh, I guess I'm getting <laughs> making more bubbles there. Let's disrupt those. There we go. And there's still a bubble or two that's left on the surface, but again, the fact that that's not, those bubbles aren't rising and dissipating uh, tells you that's not oxygen, that's just trapped air. Uh, so again, you can see the little bits of flakes in there, those are flakes of potato, not uh, actual oxygen gas. Okay, if they were bubbles of oxygen gas, they'd be rising up to the surface. Okay, they're just sinking to the bottom because they're potatoes. And I just wanted to point out this uh, little difference uh, between boiled potatoes, or this fresh potato over here and a boiled potato over here on the right. Uh, you know, so. Uh, again, if, if you notice that difference in catalytic activity between them, uh, again, catalase, which is a protein found in potatoes, is an enzyme, which is a protein catalyst, right? It acts as a catalyst, and, you know, I could let you interpret the evidence you see in this lab. Uh, but the key thing to realize with our boiled potato and why uh, the, any enzymes present in your boiled potato don't work, it's because uh, proteins get denatured when you heat them up. Uh, they essentially change their shape, uh, and the shape of a protein is very important for its function, okay? So it, it stops behaving, uh, you know, the way it normally does. It's, its physical and chemical properties change when you heat it up, and it changes its shape. Um, so the uh, catalase that's present in a boiled potato no longer functions as catalase. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. In this part of the lab, we're going to take copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate. See these nice, uh, uh, brilliant blue crystals, uh, very pretty looking. Uh, and we are going to drive off that water of hydration uh, using a Bunsen burner. We're going to light up our Bunsen burner, heat up our, our copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate, and it will form the resulting anhydrous copper 2 sulfate. Okay, so the water basically separates from our crystals. We will then add water to this anhydrous copper 2 sulfate and do the reverse reaction. So we'll basically turn it back into uh, this hydrated salt. Okay, so, so observe what, the, uh, what our solid looks like in both of the steps involved here. Okay, so please note our initial appearance. Um, 
and our final appearance, you know, so before and after heating, and then the initial and final appearance after adding water. Now, please note, the final appearance after heating is going to be the same as the initial appearance before adding the water, because it's the same test tube. Okay, let's go ahead and turn on our Bunsen burner here. Doing this, of course, take off the cork. Uh, you don't want to catch that on fire. We're going to use a test tube clamp here. So that's uh, when you're using a test tube clamp, uh, clamp it to the top of your test tube. Uh, make sure you're angling your test tube away from your neighbors and away from your own face. So um, I am standing here, obviously on this side of the Bunsen burner. I'm going to angle the test tube away from me. So let's put that back so you can see that. Uh, I just need to have the opening uh, the top uh, have my the bottom of my test tube on the top of my flame uh, you don't want to have it uh, get it too hot uh, just so that that way you don't have um, any of your material sputtering out basically and notice that I don't know if you can see that ring of vapor heat, uh, hitting the uh, you know just rising up as I initially heated but now it's starting to warm up Let's uh, move this a bit closer so you can get a better view of what this looks like. Though, actually, if I bring this here, you can already start to see a change in those nice blue crystals. So, here, I'll bring the webcam up like that. They start to see some changes there. Observe the water vapor leaving, uh, well, you're actually seeing the water reforming, and that's the, the, um, the vapor, or the um, steam you see coming off is water vapor hitting the surrounding cold air and reforming as droplets of water. Uh, you can actually see droplets of water on our test tube, near the mouth of the test tube that's cooler. Uh, you can see where it's condensed down into actual droplets of water. Okay, so you can see that... Uh, I've still got a little bit of the and of the uh, hydrate at the top there, but you can see uh, clearly there's a difference uh, with the stuff on the bottom. Okay. I'll just try and heat that a little bit more evenly, and, and we can compare that a little bit more. Okay, so hopefully you should see uh, we no longer have that nice brilliant blue color that we had. Initially, you should be able to describe that. Well, hopefully, that should uh, once that comes into focus a little bit, that should help you describe your salt. Okay, let's set that down to cool, and we can describe that a little bit better. Okay, so here's uh, what our sample looks like after. Heating. So this is our final appearance after heating. Okay, so please make a note of how that looks different from the initial appearance that we started with. So I mentioned earlier that the final appearance of our test tube after heating is the same as the initial appearance before we add water. So here's our initial appearance before we add our water. And I'm going to add a few drops uh, using this dropper of... Uh, of water into our test tube. So just observe what happens as drops go in. Please note the change in color there, and here we have our final appearance after adding water.
over here I have two test tubes of 0.1 molar copper 2 chloride. That's CuCl2. Um, so copper 2 chloride, as you can see, is a light blue solution. And we're going to add hydroxide ions in the form of sodium hydroxide here to make a precipitate of copper 2 hydroxide. So let's add a couple of drops here just to each of these. And you can see what will happen. Notice where the drops hit the solution, get this nice uh, sort of dark blue precipitate. Let's see if that, it's a little hard to see, maybe I should add a little bit more here. And you can probably see it here before it's shaken up. I'm going to let it come into focus. And there it is, and so if I shake that up, see that bright blue precipitate. Let's add a little bit more sodium hydroxide so it's a little bit more obvious. I think when I add a, a squirt at a time, that makes it a little bit easier to see the uh, copper 2 hydroxide that's forming. You can see it's a different shade of blue there and a little bit uh, makes this definitely a little bit more cloudier. Yeah, I think now it should be hopefully a little bit easier to see uh, that brighter blue color of the copper 2 hydroxide that we're making uh, as opposed to the sort of greenish blue of the original copper 2 chloride. Uh, so let's go ahead and shake that up so you can see the effect. You can also notice that it's getting you know, our, our mixture is definitely more opaque here, you know, than it was, uh, than what we started with. Um, copper 2 chloride, for the most part, is, uh, is aqueous, it's water-soluble, um, but I think uh, maybe due to the concentration, it has like a little bit of cloudiness to it, maybe because it's a little cold in here. Uh, but you can see here clearly now that we've got that solution of, or that uh, precipitate of copper 2 hydroxide. Okay, so make a note of this initial appearance of test tube 1 and test tube 2 in our, uh, you know, after we've added hydroxide to each of them. Okay. Now, I'm going to go ahead and add some more hydroxide to test tube 1. Let's see if we can notice any change in appearance uh, compared to test tube 2, which will mark what it looked like originally. Hopefully, you'll notice that when we add more hydroxide to test tube 1, there's a change in color compared to what it used to look like. So test tube 2 also gives us a nice reference for that initial appearance of, uh, of our test tube 1. Okay, so notice that, that change in color as it starts settling down a little bit. So I need to shake it up to try and make it a little bit more obvious again. It's, it's a little subtle, but that's the, the change in color there. Okay, so now to test tube 2, I'm going to add some hydrochloric acid. I have uh, 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid here, and I'm going to add an equivalent amount dropwise to test tube 2. Uh, this should hopefully make uh, the difference even more stark, uh, because what hydrochloric acid is going to do is it's going to react with our uh, hydroxide ions in test tube 2 and remove them um, from the solution. And you should see the shift in equilibrium accordingly. Got a comparable volume in there now. 
So let's uh, shake that up a little bit. And there you go. You can see a clear difference now uh, because we've used up our hydroxide. And you can see that we've gone back to our copper ions being water soluble. Okay, so hence the, the test tube cleared up a bit. All right, um, so hopefully you should be able to see the clear difference between our, our two test tubes. So remember here in test tube one, we added more uh, hydroxide uh, to our solution. So think about how that had changed our equilibrium, which way it shifted it. And in test tube two, we added uh, hydrochloric acid, which used up hydroxide. And think about which way that shifted that equilibrium. Uh, please note in the questions that, uh, that get asked here, um, when they define reactants and products, they're defined in the way that uh, they're labeled in the instructions. So, so if you go back to your, uh, to your uh, procedure, you'll notice that your equilibrium has copper ions plus hydroxide ions on the left-hand side, that those are your reactants, and the solid copper to hydroxide, the, the cloudy stuff, is uh, labeled as a product in this equilibrium. Okay, so please make a note of that when you're answering the questions, uh, you know, and you're explaining which is the direction of the reactants and which is the direction of the products. In this last part of the lab, we're going to look at one equilibrium in particular. We're going to take um, iron 3 plus ions from our uh, iron 3 nitrate here, okay, also commonly known as ferric nitrate. Uh, we're going to react it with potassium thiocyanate. So the thiocyanate ions in our solution are going to form a complex with the iron 3 plus ions. Now, uh, we've seen this reaction multiple times before. Uh, if you recall, you'll get this sort of uh, dark reddish color uh, from the complex that's formed. Okay. Now, this dark red complex exists in equilibrium with the original ions uh, separate here. So uh, we're going to see Le Chatelier's principle by playing around with this equilibrium. We're going we're to make a mixture of these two uh, compounds, right, uh, and start off with six test tubes off that mixture. Okay, now one of these is going to be a reference. We'll just add water to it. Uh, but we're going to add various things uh, to our other test tubes, or in the case of the last two test tubes, we're going to change their temperature. And we're going to see the effect of these uh, different changes to the equilibrium on the equilibrium. All right, I've uh, added uh, 10 milliliters of 0 0.01 molar iron 3 nitrate. Uh, I measured at uh, 10 milliliters in a graduated cylinder and went ahead and already poured it into this, uh, to this beaker here. Uh, you can see it's this uh, kind of yellowish solution. Uh, you may recognize it again from, uh, from a couple of labs ago. Um, over here, I've measured out 10 milliliters of 0 0.01 molar potassium thiocyanate. Uh, again, notice it's a clear colorless solution. Oops, let's see if I can, there we go. That should be a little bit easier to see that color there. Uh, now, if you observe, when I add one to the other, Notice that rich red color that we observe. Okay, and so, and we have this nice uh, red, deep red solution, kind of a blood red, uh, or like a wine red, I guess, uh, that we, that's the uh, iron thiocyanate complex that we make. Okay, so that's what we're going to add to each of our, our six test tubes, and we'll go from there. All right, you can see here that I've added uh, about three milliliters of the solution uh, of our equilibrium mixture to our six test tubes. Now, to our first one over here on the left, I'm going to add 10 drops of just plain distilled water here. Um, and we're going to use that as our reference test tube. And there we go. All right, so we have uh, 10 drops of water there. Just gonna shake that up a little bit. Uh, slightly dilute our, our solution down, but you can see that uh, 
you know, and increase our volume obviously as well. Uh, but uh, make a note of the color that we've got here. Uh, I'll leave this up uh, so then we can compare colors uh, for all of our subsequent test tubes that we're going to add different chemicals to. All right, so over at test tube number two, I'm going to add 10 drops of one molar uh, iron three nitrate. Okay, so uh, the thing to observe here, of course, with our iron three nitrate, uh, first of all, uh, notice that this is uh, one molar uh, iron three nitrate, so it's much more concentrated than the uh, solution we started off with. So uh, the key thing here is that we're adding iron three plus ions to this. So think about how that might affect the equilibrium between our uh, individual ions of iron three plus and thiocyanate on the left, uh, on the reactant side, and our iron thiocyanate complex on the product side of this equilibrium. All right, so let's go ahead and add our 10 drops of solution uh, of our iron 3 plus solution to this. Okay, so hopefully you've noticed uh, a key, you know, especially if I shake this up, there it goes, it's nice and evenly mixed. Uh, you should be able to notice a, a key difference between test tube number two that we added our iron three nitrate ions to uh, and test tube number one, which was our reference. Okay, so please make a note of that difference. Now, to test tube number three, we're going to do something similar. We're going to add one molar thiocyanate, uh, potassium thiocyanate solution. So again, the idea here is we're adding the reactant thiocyanate. Okay, so think about well, how this might affect your equilibrium. shake and once again you can kind of compare its color to our reference test tube and uh, again you should be able to see a clear difference uh, between these two test tubes. Okay so now for test tube number four we're going to take a concentrated solution of hydrochloric acid. All right, so it's three molar HCl. Uh, hydrochloric acid is going to react with our Fe3 plus ions in solution uh, and form an iron chloride complex, um, which basically prevents the iron ions from reacting with thiocyanate. So what effectively this is going to do is this is going to remove uh, iron 3 plus, okay, that, that reactant Fe3 plus from the solution. Okay, so think about the effect this is going to have on your equilibrium accordingly. So we're going to go ahead and add this to test tube number four. That's this test tube over here. Shake that up just to make sure that everything's well mixed. Okay, and again, you should be able, hopefully, to see the difference between our test tube number four and our reference test tube number one. There should be a pretty discernible difference between the two. Okay, so please make a note of that difference and account for that difference. Why did that? Uh, why do we see the difference that we do? You know, which way has this equilibrium shifted? All right, for the last part of this, uh, this section, in the lab in general, we're going to take test tubes five and six. We're going to put them into an ice water bath and a hot water bath, respectively, uh, and see how that affects our equilibrium. All right, so uh, when, uh, you know, accordingly, you'll see that one of these uh, will shift towards the reactant side, the other shifts to the product side. Uh, you should be able to tell pretty easily based on the color change, right, uh, you know, and describe that accordingly uh, to explain why you know, you can tell one's the reactant and one's the product. Uh, 
the reason for this shift is that heat could be treated as either a reactant or a product, okay? So remember, uh, for an endothermic reaction, heat's absorbed by the reaction, right? So you could treat heat as a reactant in that respect. Uh, likewise, for a, uh, an exothermic reaction, uh, heat is given out, okay? So heat's a product, in other words. Uh, so for our equilibrium, um, heat's going to be uh, on one side of the equation. So if you're looking at that forward reaction, it's either going to be endothermic or exothermic. Uh, so heat's going to be a reactant or product accordingly. Uh, and the opposite, of course, for the reverse reaction. Uh, so for the last part of this lab, we're going to figure out on what side of the equation we're going to write down heat. Uh, so, you know, just look at the way this equilibrium shifts in these last two test tubes once we put them in our hot and cold baths, respectively. Uh, and you're going to observe whether heat, uh, you know, add, how adding heat changes the equilibrium and how removing heat changes the equilibrium. Okay, and that'll tell you whether heat's on the reactant side or the product side. All right, as you can see, I've uh, had my test tube number five over here uh, cooling down in an ice bath. Okay, and uh, over here, test tube number... Uh, six, uh, heating up in our hot water bath. Uh, so they've been heating in there for, or while well, sitting in there, in their respective baths for quite a bit of time. Um, and so, yeah, hopefully we can observe a little bit of a difference here between them. So let's uh, take the two of those out. Okay, so here I've gotten our two test tubes. So test tube five on the left, that was in the ice bath. Uh, test tube six on the right, that was in the hot water bath. And hopefully you should be able to clearly see the difference between them. Uh, it's a little, subtle, a little bit more subtle than some of our other test tubes, but uh, again, you should be able to tell the difference here uh, and tell which one shifted to the reactant side and which one shifted to the product side. Uh, so even though uh, one of our test tubes hasn't gotten as dark as some of the other test tubes, uh, I will point out that our reactant, um, that one of our reactants at least, uh, iron three nitrate, uh, is that sort of uh, yellowish color. And our product, the iron uh, thiocyanate complex, is a, uh, a deep uh, red color. Um, so uh, based on that, uh, you should be able to figure out what's going on in these two test tubes. All right, so here are all six of our test tubes uh, shown once again. Uh, again, if you want to compare with our reference, uh, you can see, uh, again, uh, all, all of how each of our test tubes have uh, changed color uh, accordingly. And again, with the last two, it's, uh, it's a little subtle, uh, you know, in terms of that, uh, that difference, but uh, hopefully lined up next to the reference and perhaps one of the other test tubes, you should be able uh, to figure out what's happened in test tubes uh, five and six. All right, so let's just uh, briefly walk through the lab report together. Um, I think uh, part A should be pretty straightforward. Um, uh, please note uh, all of the questions in this lab report have to do with interpreting your, uh, your observations, uh, your results. Um, so please answer all of the questions that are tied into this lab report. Okay, none of them are just practice problems. They're all relevant to the lab. For part A2, um, please note that we only measured the total time. We used a stopwatch. Uh, so even though we have columns here that uh, say initial time and final time, uh, that would be if you had a running clock uh, that you were using. Uh, so really, you can just ignore these two columns here. Uh, just leave those blank. Only record the time uh, from the stopwatch in this column. Okay. Uh, when you're Framing your answer, please be careful. Uh, I mentioned this in the video, but be careful about the difference between time versus rate or speed. Okay, uh, those are not the same thing, and how you describe your answer uh, gets kind of flipped depending on which word you use. So, so be careful of what word you use in your answer. Uh, for example, if if a, if a reaction speeds up, the rate is faster. Uh, the time is uh, the time is shorter, right? It takes less time for the reaction to happen if it's a faster reaction with a higher rate. Uh, so, and and vice versa, obviously. So, be careful about how you frame your answer. Uh, I'll accept either way you frame it, whether you're talking in terms of 
uh, speed or rate, or if you mention time, uh, just be careful because I've had students who uh, you know, use one and mean the other. Um, with questions three and four, um, I kind of talked already about question three, or sorry, question four, uh, in terms of the the difference between a fresh and boiled potato. Uh, it, you know, I probably went into a little bit more detail than I should have, but again, this is just for the benefit of those of you who may not have come across uh, catalysts or proteins and things like that, enzymes, uh, if, especially if you haven't taken a biology class before. With question three, though, I want to draw your attention um, to the way you should frame your answer. Uh, there's actually two parts to this question, and I think where a lot of students go wrong is that they only answer one part of the question. Okay, so the question is, how does a catalyst change the rate of a reaction without affecting its equilibrium? Okay, so I think most students usually answer the change the rate of the reaction part, and by that I mean don't just say that it speeds up the reaction. Explain how does it speed up the reaction. Um, but you need to address that second half of that question. Why doesn't a catalyst change the equilibrium position? Okay, now there are multiple ways uh, you could frame this. Uh, but uh, typically I would recommend looking at both um, you know, the forward and the reverse reaction for this equilibrium. Okay, so think about the effect of, uh, you know, usually like when you're thinking about how your catalyst changes the rate of a reaction, most people think of just the forward reaction, uh, but also think about what's happening to that reverse reaction as well, okay? Uh, and that should answer that second half of that equation, uh, of that question. All right, and um, let's see, for, for B1, I mentioned this in the video, but again, uh, please note that the uh, final uh, condition here uh, after you've heated up your test tube is your starting point, your initial for be right before you add water. So, so whatever observation you have here also goes over here, okay? Yeah, and I think uh, for both uh, B1 and B2, uh, please note that when they talk about reactants and products, um, and really this applies to part C as well, wherever we mention reactants and products, uh, that's the way it's defined in the pre-lab uh, or in the directions. So if you go back to the directions, okay, you can see that uh, they give us the equation of what's going on. All right, so here in B1, here's our copper two sulfate uh, pentahydrate uh, that's defined as our reactant over here, okay? And our anhydrate is the product as this equilibrium is defined, as this reversible reaction is defined. In the case of uh, part B2, please note that here, our copper ions and hydroxide ions are the reactants, and our product is the copper 2 hydroxide, okay? Uh, with Part C, um, our iron three ions and our thiocyanate ions are reactants, and the red iron thiocyanate complex is our product. So again, keep that in mind when you're answering the questions for part C. All right, um, so I think most of that should be relatively straightforward. Uh, when we get to that last part, uh, question 14 over here, um, all you've got to do here is you just have to add heat. Um, so uh, if heat is a reactant, you would just add heat plus on the left-hand side. It's just saying heat plus iron, three plus, plus thiocyanate gives us our, that complex. Or if you determine that heat is a product, then you would put heat on the right-hand side of the equation. You just have uh, iron thiocyanate complex plus heat. You would write that over here. Okay, so that's it for this lab. Um, if you have any questions, just let me know, and good luck.